Good afternoon. I'm Doug Doach, a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. Um, joining me today as co-presenters are Salim Saud, Jose Valera, and Kelly Kramer. Salim is a partner in our associated firm, Tawil & Checker, uh, in Brazil, and he is in the Rio office uh, concentrating on um, uh, enforcement uh, and anti-corruption issues. Jose Valera uh, is a partner in our Houston office. Uh, Kelly Kramer uh, is a partner in our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping announcements. As we go along, we hope that you will ask questions by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We will make every effort to answer questions toward the end of the webinar, but if we're unable to answer your questions during the presentation, we'll follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. For those lawyers out there regarding CLE credits, uh, during the presentation, we will be providing an alphanumeric code, and I think uh, Salim uh, Saud will read it out. In order to receive CLE credit, uh, participants must record this code, this alphanumeric code, on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you along with the login instruction for today's program. Let's get started, and I turn it over to Salim. Thank you, Doug. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this presentation uh, uh, is a little bit different from the ones that we have done in the past because so far we have only focused on investigations going on in Brazil. Uh, we are now uh, going to analyze as well some of the replications in other countries in Latin America. But the, uh, for those of you who have not attended uh, uh, the previous presentations, um, I just want to explain a little bit how the corruption scheme is, uh, uh, was conducted uh, allegedly according to the Brazilian authorities. So Petrobras, which is a Brazilian national oil company, was in the middle of the scheme, and uh, um, uh, Petrobras uh, uh, was hiring certain construction companies to perform, perform some contracts for, for, for them, some, uh, some EPC contracts for them. Uh, these contracts were allegedly, uh, uh, allegedly had some overprices, and uh, uh, part of these uh, additional amounts paid to, to these construction companies would allegedly end up uh, uh, in the hands of certain Petrobras employees and certain political parties. So uh, uh, the, the construction companies would hire some consultancy firms, uh, and they would pay. Uh, um, they would enter into uh, consulting agreements with these firms. These firms would uh, uh, invoice the construction companies. Um, they would pay taxes and uh, uh, would have the appearance of a normal transaction, except that no work would actually be performed. And uh, uh, the, amount that, uh, the amount that these consultancy companies would, would charge would then be uh, um, uh, transferred, partially to some of, uh, of the Petrobras employees involved in the scheme. And when we refer to such as Petrobras employees, we're actually referring to members of the board of Petrobras. Um, and uh, 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 part of the money would also end up um, uh, with certain political parties, uh, more notably PT, which is a party of uh, President Rousseff, PMDB, which is a party of Vice President Hammer, and PP, which is a party of the coalition. The investigations started in uh, uh, 2009 as an investigation on certain money launderers that were using gas, station, uh, gas stations to, to conduct the operations. That's why this, uh, uh, this whole operation was called car wash, or in Portuguese, La because, uh, 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 because of the gas station connection. But at a certain point, uh, they found that one uh, of the, of the uh, money launderers actually sent, uh, um, gave us a gift, uh, gave a gift to a Petrobras officer. Uh, he gave a, a, a car that is considered a, a luxury car in Brazil, um, a Land Rover. And that caught a little bit of the attention of the authorities. And when they looked into that, they found the Petrobras connection and they started to investigate the Petrobras connection. That happened in 2014. Um, and uh, this individual was called um, um, uh, Alberto Costa, and um, he was arrested in March of last year. And uh, uh, since then, the operation started to move on, uh, focusing a fair amount on Petrobras. 
Um, uh, he was arrested in March. He was able to to, to be released on a uh, habeas corpus. He was arrested again uh, in August, and by that time, uh, it was pretty much clear that there was a corruption scandal going on in Petrobras. And uh, uh, the operations have been unfolding uh, uh, little by little. But then uh, um, the election period is started, and during the election period, the federal police and the, the public prosecutors were actually quite quiet about the issue, and nothing happened. Um, at that time, there was a congressional investigations committee uh, investigation uh, investigating on, on, on the on the matter, but it also uh, uh, did not make much uh, of of, uh, of any findings uh, uh, during this period. Right after the election, we had um, uh, what was the uh, what actually called the attention of most of the people uh, to this to this investigation, which was the uh, what was called Operation Doomsday. Uh, on that date, and it happened in November 14, uh, 2014, um, it was a Friday, and uh, uh, pretty much the the. the uh, um, uh, high executives of the largest construction companies in Brazil were arrested. In addition to them, a number of Petrobras uh, uh, employees. The total number of arrests uh, on that day were, uh, were about 30, uh, of which 12 uh, uh, high-ranked executives. This has never happened before, and that actually caught the attention of, of most of the population uh, to the corruption scandal. About a month later, the Congressional uh, Investigations Committee issued a report, and the report uh, basically, basically concluded that there was uh, some corruption at Petrobras, and that related mostly to SBL Offshore, which is a, a Dutch company that entered into a plea, um, into a leniency agreement with Dutch authorities acknowledging corruption uh, uh, in, in West Africa and uh, in Brazil related to Petrobras. So it was. It was a little bit harder for the for the Congressional Investigations Committee to conclude otherwise, um, and uh, uh, but other than that, um, it did not actually conclude that there was uh, uh, corruption. But it did conclude that uh, uh, certain companies, and there was a list of about, of about 30 companies, should be investigated. Well, uh, that was in 2014. Then uh, the year uh, turned in 2014, we actually saw an intensification of the investigations. So if we compare the, the timeline between the two years, uh, the previous slides show the timeline for 2014 with certain uh, uh, events, and this is the timeline for the first, uh, 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 just for the, for the uh, 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 in Brazil it's the fall uh, term or in the U.S. the spring term um, of, uh, um, uh, of 2014 just at uh, the beginning of the year, and it shows much more events than the previous year. So the investigations continued pretty much every month. Um, there is a new phase of the operation. Uh, very interestingly, the Brazilian Federal Police and the Public Prosecutors have divided this operation in, in seven different phases or operations, and uh, um, they are spaced uh, from each other more or less about a month apart. And it, by doing that, they actually created some sort of a soap opera. Brazilians are famous for their soap operas, and uh, um, with, uh, this operation has been conducted as a soap opera, and every new month there is a new chapter, and everyone stay tuned uh, uh, for the new development. Uh, so uh, in addition to those uh, 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 different phases of the operation, we also had uh, uh, investigations going on again at the Congress, there was a, um, a new legislature took, uh, uh, took office in the beginning of the year, and in February they started a new Congressional Investigations Committee. Um, and, uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, there, were, uh, 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 there are so many uh, uh, politicians involved uh, that politics and uh, uh, the investigations could, uh, started to be intertwined. And in March of this year, uh, uh, um, the general public prosecutor he started uh, uh, investigations against 55 sitting politicians, uh, members of parliament, ministers of state, and governors of state. And uh, these investigations are being conducted at the Supreme Court or the Superior Court of Justice because these individuals, they have what is called a prerogative of venue. Uh, they are entitled to be judged not by lower courts, but by the Supreme Court uh, of the country. 
the investigations went on, and uh, we also had a number of more uh, of, of other uh, uh, executives being arrested or, or detained for questioning. And uh, in the last phases, um, uh, the investigation actually took a different turn. Initially, uh, the companies were being, investigated, uh, were being investigated for corruption in the downstream sector of Petrobras, uh, refineries, and uh, uh, mostly refineries. Um, uh, towards the middle of the year, uh, the investigations also focused on the upstream, um, which is exploration and production, and uh, it also took a, a, a turn to other industries. Um, in the 16th phase uh, that happened in July of this year, um, uh, Petrobras, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Cabosh operation focused on nuclear brass and electrobras, which is the nuclear power uh, company and the power company of Brazil. So it actually uh, uh, included different uh, um, industries in the investigation. In the second uh, semester of this year, uh, the investigations focused mostly on the political uh, uh, connections uh, of the scandal. And we had uh, the former Minister uh, of Institutional Relations of, of uh, uh, former President Lula arrested. Um, José Durstil, um he was at the time already uh, in house arrest due to his involvement in the previous uh, uh, corruption scandal uh, called Mensalão, which was uh, a scandal that um, uh, was judged by the Supreme Court in 2013, and uh, members of the government were found to be guilty um, uh, of paying monthly bribes to certain uh, um, members of, the, uh, of, of parliament so that they would secure their, their votes um, on uh, um, on, 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 on both there would be uh, uh, in the interest of the government. So uh, while he was under arrest, uh, uh, under house arrest, he was arrested and taken to, to prison in Curitiba uh, in connection with uh, uh, the scandal at Petrobras. And uh, uh, the treasurer of PT, the former treasurer of PT, was also arrested um, at the time. Um, and he is known for having coined this slang, uh, a term that is um, used uh, now. It, it became a popular term, but at the, at the time, no one actually used it uh, with this meaning. Um, and he basically coined this word for uh, to mean bribe. And they named uh, that phase of the operation as special echo, which is uh, um, the, the slang or the term created by uh, PT's treasurer. Uh, in this, in this, uh, 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 in the current phase uh, of the of the investigations, and mostly in August, uh, uh, the focus was politicians uh, linked to to the ruling party PT, and also uh, uh, some individuals that were. Uh, 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 they were conducting the same bribery scheme, but not in Petrobras, but in the Ministry of Planning and in the Ministry of, uh, uh, of Health. Um, the most recent phase of the operation, it happened actually about a month ago, a little over a month ago, and interestingly, um, it's uh, one of the first times in this operation since the, the elections that we have more than a month without any arrests going on. And uh, the last phase of the operation, um, which happened uh, in September 2014, I'm sorry, uh, September 2015, it's, uh, it was called Nessun Dorma. Nessun Dorma means, uh, it's Italian, it's, it's actually the title of an area um, of uh, uh, the opera Turban Dope, and it means uh, no one shall sleep, uh, which was a warning by the federal police that Everyone should be vigilant, and, and because the operations have not stopped, um, they are. Uh, uh, the federal police has been very humorous in naming the, the different phases of Operation Kawash, and this only shows a little bit of their humor uh, by sending the message that more people might be arrested in the future. The fact that it's taken more than a month uh, from the last operation might be uh, uh, linked to, to, to this message saying 
uh, then even if things uh, slow down for a little, no one should still think that things uh, uh, that the operation has stopped. So what is the current status of the operation in Brazil? Um, investigations are still going on uh, in several different offices and different agencies. The federal police and the public prosecutors are questioning several individuals. Um, um, the current largest case going on uh, uh, is uh, being, in, being uh, uh, in the phase of questioning is uh, the investigations against Odebrecht um, and uh, uh, more notably, uh, um, the CEO of the company, Mr. Marcelo Odebrecht, um, depositions are being taken uh, at this very moment on, on, on that case. Um, um, and uh, um, several different companies, uh, state-owned companies, have been involved in investigations, not only Petrobras, but also uh, Electrobras, Nuclebras, um, uh, there is the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Planning and uh, Country Economic Federal so far. Um, we'll have criminal proceedings going on at the Supreme Court uh, for those individuals that have a prerogative of venue, most no, uh, more notable members of parliament. We also have uh, uh, investigations going on at the Creativa Court for uh, uh, pretty much everyone else, uh, um, uh, considering that these, these other individuals do not have a prerogative of venues. Um, we have investigations going on at CADE, uh, which is the antitrust authority because the construction companies are known, uh, are, uh, 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 um, uh, not known, but uh, allegedly, according to the authorities, they are uh, considered to have, to have formed a cartel uh, to influence the bids at Petrobras. We have uh, investigations going on at CGU, which is a federal agency responsible for uh, enforcing the Brazilian anti-corruption law. There is 29 proceedings going on, and um, uh, the agency has reportedly uh, been negotiating six leniency agreements. Um, Brazil has enacted a, a new anti-corruption law in 2013, and this law allowed the authorities uh, to enter into leniency agreements for violations of the law, uh, and also of the public bids law. Um, the CGU is the agency of the federal government in this authority to enter into these leniency agreements, and it is currently uh, uh, negotiating the agreements. There are several lots, uh, and probably lawsuits against the individuals involved in the cases, and also uh, several of the companies involved in the cases. And uh, there was a Congressional Investigations Committee going on, uh, the one that started in February and uh, it concluded its works uh, about a week ago. Uh, it issued its report in, on October 22nd. Um, the um, Congressional Investigations Committee was controlled by um, uh, members uh, of the government coalition, but it had uh, 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 members of, uh, of the opposition party as well. And uh, uh, the focus of the, of, the, uh, of the investigation was on the Petrobras uh, uh, scandal. And the results of the investigation, uh, I'm actually showing the CLE code a little bit early, but the results of the uh, investigations were that uh, they decided not to indict any politicians. Um, they uh, uh, suggested further investigation on the APC companies in the shipyards that, were, that had contacts with Petrobras. Um, they also suggested the indictment, the indictment of several individuals, including something that is, uh, uh, was later considered to be uh, um, uh, unlawful, which was uh, uh, the indictment of uh, uh, certain individuals that were not named. They, uh, the report actually uh, uh, suggested that uh, um, uh, the authorities should indict the legal representatives of certain companies. Um, that was in the first draft of the report, which was drafted without uh, uh, much uh, um, of a legal, uh, um, uh, much of attention to the legal requirements. And then in the final report, they removed uh, such, uh, um, such uh, uh, recommendations. The report uh, was issued in the middle uh, of a political crisis uh, that the Brazilian Congress is, is, uh, is going through, which is the involvement of the Speaker of the House in the investigations. 
The Speaker of the House, Mr. Eduardo Cunha, is being investigated at the Supreme Court for receiving some certain bribes and uh, uh, in connection with Operation Car Wash. And he was the one uh, also, uh, uh, and he was very vocal through uh, the last uh, uh, few months um, against the government for the government's involvement in, in the corruption, even though he's a member of the of PMDB, which is a party, uh, the party of the vice president and a party of the government's coalition, has positioned himself uh, in the opposition and uh, uh, has been very vocal against the government. Um, since the eruption of the scam, uh, of the scandal uh, uh, involving him, and uh, more recently there was uh, um, another involvement of uh, um, uh, new allegations against him for having undeclared bank accounts in Switzerland. Uh, uh, Congress has uh, come to, to political uh, 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 crisis, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, congressional report was issued uh, uh, in the middle of this political crisis. And that's why uh, uh, some people believe that uh, there was a decision not to suggest uh, any wrongdoings uh, of any politicians. Um, well, this is uh, uh, the status of investigation in, in Brazil. I will now pass uh, 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 the floor to Jose Valera that will describe uh, the status of the investigations in Peru. Thank you, Salim. This is um, uh, Jose Valera. Good day, everyone. What we have concerning Peru is, on the one hand, a number of the large construction companies, Brazilian construction companies, that are involved in the car wash scandal in Brazil, happen to have obtained very large contracts in Peru to carry out energy infrastructure or transportation infrastructure projects. And on the other hand, as a result of the investigations in Brazil, some facts and allegations have come out that would provide an indicia of suspicious activities or relationships between former Brazilian government officials and Peruvian government officials or these companies with respect to Peruvian government officials that have prompted the Peruvian government to take a look at uh, the relationships between these Brazilian construction companies and their uh, projects in Peru. Uh, there are several uh, collaborators with uh, Brazil's uh, investigations that are uh, giving a lot of um, uh, alleged uh, facts uh, involving the um, uh, conduct of uh, former government officials and uh, as has been alleged uh, to the effect that many former government officials uh, tried to lobby the government uh, to obtain contracts uh, for the benefit of Brazilian companies. It is being alleged that former Brazilian government officials also lobbied the Peruvian government on behalf of Brazilian construction companies to get contracts in Peru, and those Brazilian construction companies are the same companies involved in car wash. So all these uh, facts and allegations being uncovered in the Brazilian investigations are prompting the Peruvian government to take a look at what is going on in, in Peru. One, one important difference uh, between Peru and Brazil is that Peru does not have a state-owned oil company um, uh, as large as, as Petrobras. Uh, the contracts that the Brazilian construction companies uh, have in Peru are directly with the Peruvian government, not with a state-owned or state-owned control uh, company. Uh, Peru does have a few state-owned uh, companies that carry out commercial operations, but nowhere near the scale and, and economic significance as uh, Petrobras in Brazil. So we have here that these Brazilian companies have contracts with uh, directly with the Peruvian government, and, and, and another difference is the procurement rules that the Peruvian government uses uh, to engage these companies are, are different than the procurement rules that uh, Petrobras uh, conducted in the past. Uh, to give you a, an idea of the type of projects that uh, these same Brazilian construction companies are involved in Peru, I'm showing you on this slide 
um, uh, some uh, freeway uh, projects in, uh, in Lima, uh, a large convention center that has recently been concluded. And by the way, it was the convention center that was used for the annual meeting of the World Bank, of the World Bank and, the, and the IMF that uh, recently ended in, in Lima. Uh, there is a very large uh, gas pipeline being uh, constructed to bring natural gas to the southern part of Peru from the Camisea production area that is a $7 billion plus um, pipeline. Um, the Lima Metro is being expanded, and then there is a highway that is intended to connect the Pacific Ocean in Peru with the Atlantic Ocean in Brazil, and um, that is also um, being uh, constructed by one of these uh, Brazilian companies, and that has uh, major overruns. So, in Peru, because all these contracts are directly by the Peruvian government and would have been awarded directly by the, by the Peruvian government, there is, uh, and taking into account the facts and allegations being uncovered in the, in the Brazilian investigation, there is a, a two-pronged uh, investigation process that has commenced in, in Peru in order to look into whether there is anything improper in Peru as well. Um, on one hand, the Congress of Peru has uh, uh, created a special investigation committee um, to look into the um, contract awards by the current administration of President Omala and the two prior administrations of Presidents Garcia and Toledo. And there is also a uh, prosecutor that uh, has started um, a request, that has started an investigation of all these same Brazilian companies involving car wash in Brazil as to their actions in, um, in, in Peru. Uh, right now, there is no, no indictments. There is no arrests. There are uh, no specific names, contrary to what you have heard that is going on in Peru. Uh, nothing concrete has yet been uh, alleged by any congressional investigation committee or any prosecutor in Peru but those investigations continue. Um, these projects that I described to you are of great public interest in Peru. Uh, they're all in the framework of uh, public-private partnerships and are part of um, government programs to improve the uh, transportation and energy infrastructure of the country. And uh, they are very much in the public eye. And. Um, as, as time goes on, um, the microscope will be on, um, on the management of these projects and the activities of these Brazilian um, companies in Peru. And uh, if there are uh, specific um, charges being made by uh, Peruvian uh, prosecutors, uh, we will update you on, on a subsequent uh, seminar of this type. That is, uh, that is all for me. And um, I will now pass on the uh, control of the presentation to Kelly Kramer. Thank you, Jose. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what's going on in, by the U.S. law enforcement as it relates to both the Brazilian and the Peruvian investigations. And then I'm going to turn a little, to, a little bit later in the presentation to talk about a sort of a breaking investigation that's coming out of Venezuela. So, as, as some of you who have, who, have, who have participated in this series before have heard, the role of the United States here is twofold. It's, it's, it's both a primary actor in which it's undertaking its own investigations and bringing it, potentially bringing its own charges, um, but it's also uh, acting as a, basically an assistant, as an agent to Brazil and potentially also to Peru uh, in assisting the ongoing investigations. And that can take place in a lot of different forms. Uh, there's cooperation between Brazil and the United States. That's very well developed. It's, been, it's for a very long time the two countries have cooperated. And Brazil and the United States, I think, are two of the closest countries when it comes to actual formal and informal cooperation. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have the same sort of super close relationship with Peru, but there's going to we have every expectation that the United States and Peru are going to cooperate when it comes to the investigations that are taking place currently in Peru. One of the key things that the United States does probably better than anyone else is to trace money through the international banking system. And that's in part because the United States is, at least, at least as of today, is a sort of a key player 
in, in that system. Um, it is very difficult to move money from Brazil to Peru or to Panama or anywhere else in the world without it going through in one way or another a correspondent bank account in the United States or directly through a bank account in the United States. So what the United States government will often do in cases like this is they will seek and obtain what we call commissioner's authority where they can subpoena banks in the United States to obtain information about how money has been moved. So one of the key things, if you, for example, if you're in Brazil or if you're in Peru, if money is leaving Brazil or Peru and going to an offshore account someplace, which is sort of typical of how a bribery case might develop, then your ability to track that is really limited. And that's where the United States will come in. Once the United States detects the money, once it discovers how the money moved and where it, was, where it moved to offshore, it then will provide that information back to the requesting country um, and it will do so in a way that allows that information to be used in Brazilian court or in Peruvian court in connection with ongoing criminal investigations or prosecutions in those countries. So that U.S. role here, which is a little bit behind the scenes and it's not going to be something that is necessarily going to play out in a very public way, uh, is, is very active and it's been underway for quite some time in connection with the car wash operations out of Brazil and, and, I, and I have no reason to doubt that it's happening or will soon be happening in Peru. Now, the other thing that the U.S. does, and it, it does very well, is it independently investigates, it prosecutes, uh, and, if, and in the right kinds of cases, it can bring other kinds of regulatory enforcement actions. Um, and let me give you some examples of that. The DOJ and the SEC enforced the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, against issuers. Uh, such as Petrobras. And essentially what an issuer is, is it's anyone who has its stock traded in the United States, uh, and that includes people with ADRs, which Petrobras has. And the mere fact that Petrobras has ADRs that are traded here in the United States mean that both the DOJ and the SEC have jurisdiction to enforce the FCPA against Petrobras. And that's probably a very significant monetary risk to Petrobras as we sit here today. What I would, um, what has historically been the case and the way the statute is set up is that the Department of Justice, the DOJ, focuses its resources on trying to detect and prove bribery of foreign officials. I mean, that's what the DOJ focuses is on the core acts of bribery. That's what, it's, that's what its focus is going to be on. So in the Petrobras case, it presents a little bit of an unusual fact pattern because the government officials you typically would see being bribed are gonna be Petrobras employees state-owned oil company, they would be government officials, I think, under a, what most people think that the law reaches. And those folks would be getting paid, and that would be give rise to a, to a bribery offense. What's weird about this case is that Petrobras is sort of the victim here. And that is not always the case. That is not typically how this stuff plays out. So this looks a little bit unusual to have a, 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 a FCPA prosecution of Petrobras because Petrobras officials were being bribed. That's a little unusual. Typically, we see the counterparties that are the bribe payers are the ones who are being prosecuted in the United States. So that gets us to the SEC. And what the SEC enforces are basically the FCPA's books and records provisions. So under the, under the FCPA, you have an obligation as an issuer to ensure that your books and records are accurate and that you have adequate internal controls. And that's where Petrobras has, I think, some very significant problems. It's going to be very difficult for Petrobras, which is in the middle of a massive restatement, to try to defend an SEC enforcement action saying that our books and records were proper and we had adequate internal controls, when if the allegations are true, uh, they really didn't have adequate controls. The, the fact is, is that if, if you believe what's been alleged in the press and what, from some of the enforcement actions so far, Petrobras's controls weren't adequate. And they weren't able to keep track of the money that they were being paid. So the DOJ and the SEC together, I would expect would be sort of a resolution here, would be looking to come up with some sort of settlement uh, with Petrobras on some combination of a bribery and books and records theory. Now the DOJ and the SEC can also enforce the FCPA if they have some sort of jurisdictional hook against non-issuers. So for example, just a purely Brazilian company, any one of these contractors that, were, that are based in Brazil could potentially have U.S. exposure. And they could have it if they're issuers, but, but more often when we see in these cases is that there's some nexus to the United States in the offense that the prosecutors or the regulators rely upon to bring a case. And so what we look for is emails, telephone calls, or the movement of money. 
meetings in the United States. Anything like that can give rise to jurisdiction. If you look, for example, at the, the FIFA-related cases that the United States has brought recently, almost every one of those uh, contracts involved conduct mostly outside the United States. But there's enough jurisdictional activity in the United States, there's meetings, there's emails, there's money, that the U.S. prosecutors feel comfortable asserting jurisdiction. And under the case law that we have in the circuit courts, they're probably going to be affirmed on that. Not every transaction, but I think that there's enough here. There's enough in the United States that the bulk of the charges are going to be brought here and they're going to be upheld by courts. What the question is going to be in the Petrobras-related situation is, do you have that same kind of conduct? And if you do, what is DOJ, what is the SEC going to do just as a matter of discretion? And that brings me to sort of the next big question and the next big theme that the Petrobras investigations really raise. And that's this. Petrobras is basically, in many ways, the first case in a new era where we have multipolar enforcement. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that for the past 20 years, when you had international anti-corruption cases, they were prosecuted by the United States. Now, there are, there are some exceptions. Siemens, for example, was a joint investigation and prosecution with the Germans. And there are a couple of other cases where there have been significant anti-corruption enforcement actions brought by foreign countries. Uh, the U.K. certainly has stepped up its, at least its legislation, if not its enforcement, and we've seen efforts in China and other places to sort of raise an anti-corruption uh, investigative enforcement initiative. But this case is kind of unique because all of a sudden what we're seeing is multiple enforcement agencies, all with jurisdiction over the same conduct. They could all potentially put Petrobras out of business. And so now we're going to have to figure out a way Enforcement agencies are going to have to figure out a way to enforce the anti-corruption laws effectively, even though you're going to have multiple jurisdictions involved. Now, as you heard already today, I mean, we're seeing some Petrobras links playing out in Peru. There's been all sorts of press reports to suggest that the United States and Petrobras have had discussions about resolving the case. And I understand Petrobras has denied some of this, and, and it's been obviously difficult to know from the outside where any of those discussions are. But the U.S. clearly has an active investigation, and it has jurisdiction to do something if it wants to. We've already seen enforcement actions uh, in the Netherlands in connection with some of, some of their companies that were doing business in Petrobras, with Petrobras. And of course, we've seen significant enforcement actions coming out of Brazil. So what the Petrobras case is really going to be is precedent setting, really, because we've got at least four. Probably, ultimately, when this is all said and done, we could have five, six, seven, even ten countries with potential enforcement actions against companies that were counterparties with Petrobras and that were paying bribes or kickbacks to Petrobras officials. And how we divvy this up, how law enforcement divvies it up, who's going to prosecute which companies, what kind of money are we going to collect in fines, to whom is that money going to go, that is all completely unknown as we sit here today. And it's going to be a recurring issue in other types of cases. Because down the road, it's not just going to be Petrobras, there's going to be another company that gets in trouble and it's going to have jurisdictional hooks all over the world, and you're going to have multiple different enforcement agencies, all of whom have the potential to go after them under anti-corruption laws. And so what we really need to figure out, what's going to be the next big challenge in anti-corruption enforcement, is how to coordinate multipolar enforcement. How is that going to happen? And the answer right now is we don't know. I think the DOJ, the SEC, and their, and their colleagues overseas are all working on it, but there is no really transparent way of knowing how these cases are going to play out and how the different countries are going to work together or not in these sorts of investigations. Now, I want to also spend just a little bit of time talking about a newly breaking investigation. Um, one of the things that we are seeing today and one of the things that we have historically seen in anti-corruption enforcement are what we call industry sweeps. And what that means, and what, the, what law enforcement has done, is when there has been a problem at a particular kind of company, it has wondered whether other companies in that same industry are doing the same sorts of things. And so the question today is, are we facing sort of a new era of enforcement with respect to state-owned oil companies, or any state-owned companies? Forget about oil. And this is potentially a new sort of industry sweep. Obviously, these state-owned companies are going to be, more often than not, they're going to look like 
government actors, and therefore their employees are potentially going to be government officials under the FCPA. You've got a bunch of these state-owned companies, not just, of course, in Brazil and Peru, but also in Mexico and Venezuela. There's a variety of places. And so the questions are going to be, are we going to see systemic enforcement? Are we going to see stepped-up U.S. involvement involving all those countries? One where we are seeing right now a breaking investigation involves Venezuela. And there's been media reports basically in the past week and a half talking about the U.S. multi-jurisdictional investigation. I mean, by I say multi-jurisdiction in this context, I mean that there are several different U.S. attorney's offices all around the country who have opened investigations into corruption involving the, uh, the petroleum company of Venezuela, PDVSA. It's a state-owned company, and the press reports are alleging that there was a systemic pay-to-play scheme set up by the executives that controlled that company, and that what they would do is they would basically require any company that wanted to do business, PDVSA, essentially to pay the executives, sort of a straightforward kickback kind of scheme. That would be, that's potentially going to be an FCPA offense. You've got all the appropriate elements. You've got payments made to secure business to government officials as these state-owned employees, state-owned company employees are likely to be deemed. Uh, and you've got, and that gives you all the elements that you're going to need of an FCPA offense if you have jurisdiction, if you have jurisdiction. And one of the questions that is going to arise in the Venezuelan case is whether the companies that are doing business in Venezuela, whether the U.S. really can exercise jurisdiction over them. The U.S. antagonistic relationship with Venezuela in recent years has meant that the European companies and the American companies have largely fled the scene, and they've been replaced largely by Chinese, Russian, and Iranian companies. Many of those companies won't have obvious U.S. jurisdictional nexuses. But you know what? They may have money going through the United States. They may have emails. They may have meetings. So the U.S. may well have an opportunity to prosecute these cases, and it may probably will not show very little. Uh, it, it, if it has the ability to do so, let's say, I think that it will. Now, look, this is not, this is an interesting case, this PDVSA investigation. There's a key difference between this and Petrobras. In Petrobras, I said it was the first example, maybe, of multipolar enforcement. Well, that's not what we have here, I don't think. Right now, at least from what we can see in the press, there's no investigation of PDVSA really in Venezuela. Maybe there will be, maybe it's going to happen in a different way. But I don't think you've got sort of the kind of cooperation between the United States and Venezuela that you're going to see and have seen involving the U.S. and Brazil. But what you do have, at least according to press reports, is cooperation between Spain, Andorra, and the United States in connection at least with money laundering related activities. And that would be sort of potentially very important here because the United States, as I said before, is great at chasing money, trying to track it down. But when it goes overseas to places like Andorra, then it becomes difficult for the U.S. to know exactly what happens inside those companies, countries, and having cooperation across the board like that could be a game changer. So we could easily see significant U.S. enforcement actions come out of the PDVSA case. I would imagine that the executives in that case, in that, in that investigation from that company, are, are, are most vulnerable to potential prosecutions, but so are all the counterparties, all the different companies that were trying to do business there and with PDVSA. Um, certainly, those are companies that have potential exposures here. They're exactly the sort of companies that, you know, when, when we sort of talk with folks about what they should do if, they have, if they've done business with a counterparty like this, that we sort of urge them to think about conducting internal investigations, understand what the facts are, because early on you've got many more potential, you've got much more potential leverage, much more potential ability to try to figure out things that you can do to try to mitigate potential law enforcement activities. And so it becomes a place where uh, internal investigations, getting your arms around the facts and trying to figure out whether there's disclosure obligations or even disclosure opportunities make a lot of sense and it's an important thing for folks to do. So this PDVSA area is going to be a hot spot. It's going to be something to watch and we're going to be watching very closely to see if the enforcement issues start to spread away from Petrobras and PDVSA and Peru and start to infect other state-owned companies generally. And if that happens, we could see a very significant wave of FCPA enforcement actions because these are the kinds of companies that are sort of most vulnerable to FCPA enforcement. 
So that sort of covers my remarks. I want to open it up to the other panelists. Jose and Salim, I know, are much more familiar uh, and have been following closely the, the PDVSA investigations, and I want to make sure that they, you have a chance to hear from them about what they think might be next as it relates to that case. Uh, this is um, Jose Valera. The, uh, uh, as uh, Kelly mentioned, the investigation involving PDVSA is a, is a United States investigation uh, that started with uh, issues related to the contracting by uh, PDVSA of certain goods and services from uh, Spanish companies. Um, one thing to take into account in the context of uh, PDVSA in Venezuela is that more than 90 percent of the foreign currency revenues of Venezuela as a whole originate from PDVSA, uh, from the export of oil. And at the same time, uh, PDVSA is used by the government because it is essentially the only foreign currency generator um, uh, entity in the country. It is used by the government to also procure a number of goods and services that are part of the government's social programs in the country. So PDVSA is used to purchase food. PDVSA is used to procure uh, services for the construction of uh, public housing. Uh, it's, it's reach, PDVSA's reach, goes well beyond uh, just the normal core operations of an oil company, and um, it's involved in, in many, many uh, unrelated activities for an oil company simply because the government wishes to use uh, it as a vehicle to carry out uh, other of its programs. Um, the amount of money that, that PDVSA handles is uh, very, very large, and um, due to the uh, far-flung uh, nature of its activities, uh, from what we have seen so far of what we know concerning the U.S. investigation, this could touch not only companies uh, related to the oil business, but uh, companies in other areas as well. Um, so the scope of this uh, could encompass uh, many, many more industries and, and different players than the types that we're seeing in Peru and in uh, uh, Brazil so far. Um, Liam, do you want to comment on PDVSA as well? Liam, we can't hear you, so you may be on mute. Well, I'm not sure if Liam's there, so what I'm going to do is let's, let's turn to a couple of the questions that have come in, and, and we can talk about them a little bit because they're great questions. Um, one of the questions that came in is relating to, essentially, um, what, how does DOJ take into account a foreign settlement? Uh, how, how, do, how, do they, how do they think about it? Um, do, does, a, does, a, does a foreign enforcement mitigate the DOJ's desire to or need to bring its own enforcement action? Um, and I think that the answer to that is, is we're not 100 percent sure yet because there haven't been that many cases where that's happened. Um, but we are starting to see at least a couple of examples where there have been uh, enforcement actions uh, in foreign countries, and in conjunction with those enforcement actions, the United States has basically announced that it's, it's declining to prosecute a case. So, for example, the best example of this is, is SBM Offshore. SBM Offshore conducted its own internal investigation. It made its disclosures. It settled. Uh, it settled in Europe. And the U.S. announced at the same time that it wasn't going to go forward with a case against SBM. And, and what I think, well, this is just my personal view, but I think that that's going to be the kind of situation where the DOJ is going to decline. I think it's a matter of U.S. foreign policy. They would love to see, U.S. would love to see other countries enforcing anti-corruption laws in effective ways, particularly against their own companies. And I think when the United States sees that happening, unless it's a core sort of situation where um, it believes that the foreign enforcement is just inadequate, you know, they settle with, if Brazil were to settle with Petrobras for a $10 million payment, for example, the U.S. might conclude that that's just sort of, you know, home country favoritism. But in, in instances where the foreign government does a thorough investigation, 
and that brings reason charges and settles them for significant, um, significant monetary fines, I think it's the kind of place where the United States is going to step down and say, look, well, that, congratulations to the other company, and, and, I'm, and I'm for the other country, rather, and we're pleased that that enforcement action happened and we're going to decline. There's no guarantees about that. Um, and some have asked on this, on this call whether there's double jeopardy protections that would sort of forbid the United States from, from, from bringing a subsequent prosecution if you've settled overseas. And the answer to that is no, there's not, because double jeopardy only applies to a single sovereign. So if, for example, Brazil were to prosecute, that would have no impact on the, on the United States' ability to bring its own prosecution. And that's why I mentioned before, as we started thinking about how is, how, is, how is enforcement going to work on a global basis when you're dealing with multinational corporations that do business all over the place? Well, you know, that's, that's, that's really the key question here. No one knows, as we sit here today, how the anti-bribery rules are really going to play out in sort of the longer term and whether the settlements in one country, whether settlements in one country are going to work as a settlement in another country. Jose, we've gotten a question that I wanted to turn to you. It was really focused on Brazil. Um, but the question is really sort of a, it's a, it's a basic one, but it's the key one. Does it make sense to be doing business in Brazil or Peru in the oil and gas space? Uh, I, I, the, the answer is uh, yes, it makes sense. Um, there is uh, plenty of uh, commercial opportunity, both in Brazil and in Peru, to engage in the oil business without being uh, involved in these types of, uh, of problems. So I would not tar or generalize uh, the two countries as uh, being now off limits uh, for oil and gas operations. In the case of, um, and, and Peru has another big difference um, from Brazil in that co contracts, uh, in other words, you don't have the type of uh, large presence uh, in the oil sector in Peru that uh, Petrobras represents in Brazil. There is no national oil company in Peru that carries out exploration and production operations of any significance. Petro Peru still exists and it owns two refineries, but it does not carry out uh, exploration and production operations of any significance. So there is a great uh, diffusion of uh, operatorship for um, uh, oil and gas operations in Peru. And uh, there are many foreign companies uh, in Peru that carry out operations uh, pursuant to licenses with the government. And uh, there are plenty of uh, excellent uh, opportunities that are unrelated uh, to having to deal with government actors or having uh, to deal with companies that are uh, involved in the uh, car wash scandal in Brazil. And the same in Brazil. Um, uh, there are a number of concessions that have been granted directly to private sector companies. There is no legal requirement in Brazil, except for the pre-salt today, to have an association with Petrobras in any way to carry out oil and gas operations in Brazil. Uh, as an operator, you can contract services and suppliers uh, as, as you wish. Uh, subject only to certain local content uh, requirements, and there is a fair variety of, of supply in, in, in Brazil for that purpose. So you can get a, you can go about um, carrying out oil and gas operations both in Brazil and Peru in a way that does not get you near uh, or close to uh, all these problems. I don't know if Salim wants to add something to that. I think Salim has gotten disconnected, unfortunately. Okay. Because I, wanted to, I wanted to turn to Salim and ask him the, one of the great questions that we got is basically, what's going to happen in Brazil? Uh, is there going to be an impeachment? Uh, is there going to be, are, will there be charges brought against the, the president, who of course was the chair, chair, chairperson of the board at Petrobras during, uh, during the time when much of this activity occurred? Um, and I, you know, I'll sort of, I will say this, I mean, I, I try to keep pretty close uh, tabs on the situation that's emerging in Brazil, and, and most of the folks that I've told, uh, that I talk to, think that the odds of an impeachment are not zero, but that they are not high, uh, at least based on what's known today. Um, obviously, this, that's, a, that's a very important question, and it's one that we've been trying to keep an eye on as closely as we can. 
because it impacts, uh, you know, our, 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 both our practices there and, and, and pretty much all of our clients. And it's something that we're going to be trying to, to make sure that if we are seeing anything that changes that, our sort of assessment of that, that we're trying to communicate out to folks, because I know it's a topic of great interest across the board. Um, I think we're coming up on the one o'clock hour, and so Doug, I kind of, I'd like to throw it back to you uh, if, if you're if you're still on board. Oh, actually, Sleem, you're back on the line. Is that right? Uh, this is Jose Valera. Before before we close, there is a great question about Pemex, Go and uh, yeah, just to spend thirty seconds on it. The, the question is whether uh, Pemex is changing its internal controls after what is going on with Petrobras. And, and, and that's interesting. Uh, since the um, hydrocarbons legislative reform in Mexico, Pemex has been turned into what the Mexican government now calls a productive state enterprise and is uh, revamping completely the internal governance of Pemex at the same time that is imposing uh, far greater uh, transparency uh, requirements on the commercial activities of, of Pemex. So in, in general terms, the answer is yes, concerning Pemex, related to changing its internal controls, all that towards uh, greater transparency and openness and um, uh, more information uh, to the public related to, um, to Pemex's own accounts. Um, Pemex is going to cease to be a source of uh, general revenue to the Mexican Treasury, basically at the discretion of the Mexican Congress, and Pemex is going to be making payments now to the government pursuant to either contracts or a general tax regime applicable uh, generally to oil companies in, in the country. Uh, so there will be less of a siphoning of funds uh, uh, from Pemex to the Congress as directed by the Congress uh, as, as, as in the past. So I just wanted to mention that concerning uh, Pemex. Um, there are a couple of questions on, on uh, uh, Petrobras and Brazil that I, I just want to address very quickly. One of them is whether it's still worth to continue to do business in Brazil's EMP sector. Well, uh, due to the uh, uh, economic uh, reasons, companies might have different different perspectives. But the the uh, if, if the issue is only related to corruption. The answer is yes. Uh, um, Brazil, uh, especially Petrobras, is adopting a, a new uh, compliance program, a very robust one. And uh, uh, as usually happens with companies that go through this process of, of fighting corruption and, and going through, through enforcement, they uh, uh, become leaders in in the uh, in compliance. Uh, uh, so that's what we saw with Demons. That's what we saw uh, uh, with other companies involved in, in, in huge scandals. That's what everyone expects that will happen with Petrobras. Petrobras has just recently sent a questionnaire to, uh, uh, well, uh, it hasn't yet sent to all of its contractors, but it has sent a questionnaire, a due diligence questionnaire to all of it, to some of its contractors, and it will extend uh, a compliance due diligence to all of its uh, suppliers and contractors. Uh, and it will actually enforce Compliance, uh, compliance standards across the industry in Brazil. So if the concern uh, about doing business in Brazil is only related to corruption, my, my answer is yes, Brazil will uh, uh, likely be a, a much more transparent uh, country in the future. Hey, um, this is Doug. Let me just follow up on that point about doing business in Brazil right now. Um, as probably a number of people on this who are listening in know from their own business, uh, there is a lot of activity and potential activity in Brazil in the infrastructure and petrochemical sector uh, for acquisitions uh, of uh, more or less distressed assets right now. Uh, because uh, as part of this uh, set of investigations and uh, lower oil prices taken together, Petrobras and Petrobras suppliers are all under pressure to increase their liquidity positions. And so they have a large number of petrochemical um, and infrastructure related assets that they are seeking to sell. And so for those uh, with a strong stomach, um, this might actually be an interesting time to enter Brazil. 
Jalene, back to you. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. That's, uh, uh, there will be plenty of opportunities. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for another question, um, but uh, uh, um, just to answer a final one before I think we have to close, which is whether Petrobras will terminate the current contract with the companies investigated in the car wash investigation. Uh, no, uh, Petrobras will not terminate any contract until there's a final decision considering the companies cannot have contact with the public administration. Uh, Petrobras has so far suspended certain companies from entering into new contracts, but there was a unilateral decision taken by Petrobras management so that they will not award a contract to a company that is currently being investigated. But that's a precautionary decision that is not um, a penalty imposed on these companies. And these companies are actually now in the process of being um, uh, readmitted uh, to the Petrobras' uh, uh, bidding system. And that has to do with the compliance due diligence that Petrobras is implementing to all of its, in, in, into all of its suppliers and contractors. So, uh, Jose, Salim, Kelly, I think we, we have to close. Uh, we will be back to you uh, in the future with uh, additional uh, webinars and meetings and presentations on this set of themes as, as we have been. Uh, if you have questions, uh, reach out to any of us. There should be a slide coming up um, that has all of our contact details here uh, if you don't otherwise have them. Um, if you submitted a question that wasn't answered, we'll follow up with you directly. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, uh, as I said, feel free to email any of us directly uh, or email them to psantos2, that's uh, Arabic number two, psantos2 at mayorbrown.com. Uh, and um, Paula Santos will forward those questions to uh, any of the speakers. Uh, we thank you again for your participation and have a great day. Thanks again.